the larynx is um, is found right here. It's found uh, at the point where the pharynx opens into the trachea and to the esophagus. It's uh, it's the place where the two come together. Uh, the most prominent feature of the larynx is the uh, epiglottis, which is this trapdoor lid uh, to the trachea. Uh, it's attached to the hyoid bone, and uh, it is continuous with the trachea. What it does for us is that it holds the the opening of the trachea open to allow air to pass through easily. It is the switch, it's the routing channel uh, uh, that routes the air into the trachea the and food into the esophagus. The epiglottis closes when um, when we're swallowing. And the third thing it does is voice production. Uh, this is where the vocal cords are. They're found in the larynx. The larynx is really the Adam's apple. Uh, it's visible on most people. And it's made up of cartilage. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different cartilages. I'm not going to expect you to uh, memorize the names of them. But it's all made of hyaline cartilage. Um, the that holds the shape of the larynx. The epiglottis, however, uh, is made of elastic cartilage. It uh, it moves a lot and therefore has to have that elastic property. It ends up looking like this uh, when you look at it from the front. All the, uh, the cartilages are basically rings that uh, that surround the opening of the trachea. Um, and you'll see that they're continuous with uh, cartilage rings of the trachea. This is the sagittal view of it. Uh, one of the things that you, you should note is that the epiglottis uh, is attached to the, to the hyoid bone. When you swallow, the hyoid bone pivots uh, as, because when you swallow, you you push your tongue forward in your mouth, so it ends up pulling the the anterior part of the uh, epiglottis up and forward, which then brings the the lid, the the posterior part of the epiglottis, down and back, and closes very much like a garbage can lid. Uh, over the opening of the, the trachea. Now, uh, you will notice that just below the epiglottis is where we find uh, some folds, uh, the vestibular fold, which is a false vocal cord, and the, and the true vocal cords. Uh, so our voice production happens right, right there. So, um, there are ligaments uh, on either side of the larynx that really are the vocal cords. Uh, they, they have elastic fibers uh, and uh, we call the opening between them the glottis. Now, when we pass air between the, the two vocal cords, they, they vibrate and they hum, very much like a guitar string that's been plucked. Um, it we don't actually form words with, with the vocal cords. We just make a, um, we make tones. The, the formation of the word happens in the mouth. Uh, articulation happens be with the tongue and the cheeks and uh, up into the nasal passages uh, and into the sinuses really. To, uh, and we manipulate all of that to actually form words. All we can do in, with the vocal cords by tightening or loosening them is, is create a kind of a buzzing tone sound. Um, 
the tighter they are, the higher pitch. Uh, the uh, looser they are, the lower the pitch. It's just like tuning a guitar. Also, the fatter the vocal cord is, the lower the pitch. And the longer the vocal cord is, the lower the pitch. So if you have short, tight, small vocal cords, you will have a high-pitched voice. That's what kids have, little kids. If you have a large Adam's apple with um, long, thick vocal cords, uh, you will have a lower-pitched voice. The um, when you have inflammation of the vocal cords, when you have like a laryngitis or you have inflammation along there, then the, the vocal cords get thicker and your voice lowers. Uh, that's, that's why when you have that sore throat, you end up with that deep deepening of your voice. Um, the folds above it aren't part of uh, sound production. They're just for closing the glottis when, uh, when you're s swallowing. They just help further keep food out. Uh, this is what it would look like looking down the throat. Um, the true vocal cords are in that kind of silver color and they're the ones that are, are vibrating when we pass air. Um, so you release the air, open and close the glottis, and then you, you tension the uh, vocal cords for pitch. Loudness depends on how much air you move past. It's really like how hard you strum the strings. Um, so uh, the resonating chambers are all the chambers in your head and they amplify and enhance the sound quality. And uh, it's shaped by muscles of the, of the tongue, soft palate, the lips, the cheeks that kind of thing. Um, there's something called Valsalva's maneuver where you can actually stop air from going. It's, we use it every time we strain at uh, a bowel movement. Uh, we close the glottis and that's called Valsalva's maneuver. In, uh, in terms of um, medical assessment, we use Valsalva's maneuver. We have people strain, like close their glottis and push. Uh, and when we're testing disc herniations, you'll, you'll find that uh, if the head is brought forward in, into a forward flex position and Valsalva's maneuver is done, the, if the person has a herniated disc, it will increase, it'll exacerbate the pain. Um, So the trachea is the windpipe, and uh, it's, it's specialized just to do that. Um, now, it's made up of three layers. The inside layer is uh, mucosa. It's a, uh, an epithelial layer. It's ciliated. It's pseudostratified. There's goblet cells. It produces a fair amount of mucus uh, for catching dust. The cilia so it's very much like the, the nasal mucosa, except the cilia, instead of sweeping the mucus to the pharynx, uh, sweeping posteriorly, in, like in the nasal mucosa, it sweeps superiorly and it brings the, the mucus up uh, the trachea and then dumps it out um, at the epiglottis and we swallow it. it. It goes down the esophagus and we recycle those proteins. Supporting this uh, pseudostratified epithelium is a submucosa and it's a connective tissue uh, and it's, there's glands in it, etc. And then surrounding that is a connective tissue layer um, called the adventitia. Now there are cartilage rings, there's high cartilage rings that, that end up surrounding the trachea, and they work just like um, 
the wire that you find in a dryer vent or in a vacuum hose. Their, their job is to keep the, the tube open all the time to allow easy passage of air, to, re, to minimize the resistance in the, the large tube. Uh, it's called keeping it patent. Um, there's a muscle that, that closes off the C. It's on the posterior part. Uh, and we can use it uh, to contract. Uh, and and, and we, we use it to cough, to, to do that kind of thing. What we, we do is we make the tube a little bit smaller so that uh, air passes quicker. Uh, it's things speed up when it gets narrowed. Think of, uh, of whitewater rapids. The last tracheal cartilage, just before the, the, the two bronchi, the bifurcation of the two bronchi, is called the, uh, the carnea. It's a very heavily innervated projection into the, the trachea. And any time it gets uh, touched or stimulated, it causes the cough reflex. It's the... Um, it's the reason why uh, people cough if they uh, if something is smoky or dusty. Um, you know, it it it's kind of the last resort to keep things from entering the lungs from the trachea to keeping things that it will stimulate. Now, when we look at at the picture, this is looking down uh, at, a, at a horizontal section. And you'll see that the uh, esophagus sits right behind the, the trachea. The, the tracheal lumen is surrounded by this C-shaped cartilage, hyaline cartilage, uh, and is kept open. The esophagus normally is closed. And when we swallow food, the esophagus expands. And where it expands into is the lumen of the trachea, right along here. The trachealis muscle uh, relaxes, and the this expands down like this. Um, if you're choking on food and you can't breathe, it's that's what's happening. The food hasn't gone into the trachea. What's happened is the food gets stuck in the esophagus, and then the esophagus pushes into the trachea, closing down the, the lumen. Uh, when you do a Heimlich maneuver, that's uh, trying to dislodge that. Um, this is a photomicrograph of it. You can see the layers, uh, the, the cartilage, the submucosa, the mucosa, uh, the lamina propria, which is really the... Uh, the layer that holds it up, holds the mucosa up. So at the, the level of the cornea, the, uh, we, we start to get bronchi. And the first bronchi are, um, are the primary bronchi. And they look pretty much exactly like the, um, the trachea. There's, and there's two of them, one going to each lung, a left one and a right one. And then we're going to see that the, the lungs uh, divide into lobes, and there's a bronchi that, that goes to each lobe. So on the right-hand side, where there are three lobes to the lungs, there are three secondary bronchi. The left lung has two lobes, so there are two secondary bronchi there. And then each one of the, the secondary bronchi branch sending uh, bronchi to tertiary bronchi to each segment of each lobe and then it, and then they divide and they divide and they divide and they divide and then there's actually 23 layers of division uh, from the primary bronchi to the very last of the um, of the terminal bronchi the smallest bronchi going into each alveoli um, it very much resembles a tree. One trunk, a couple of main branches, uh, small, 
you know, fairly large branches off those main branches and then smaller branches and smaller branches and smaller branches until you have each little twig going to each leaf. Uh, it, so we call it the respiratory tree, the bronchial tree. So uh, all of this is not involved with, uh, with respiration, external respiration. It's all about ventilation. So it's all, it's called the conducting zone. So, uh, so at the, at the primary bronchi, they, that's where they entered the lung. And we call the, the place where they entered the lung, the hilum. That's also where the, uh, the pulmonary arteries enter the lung. Uh, the uh, pulmonary veins leave the lung, etc. cetera. Uh, so sometimes we call the secondary bronchi lobar because it goes to each, uh, each lobe. The lobes are made up of segments. So the tertiary bronchi are called segmental bronchi. It keeps on dividing until we stop naming them and we just call them bronchioles. And they're very small. Uh, this, the smallest ones are the terminal bronchioles and they end up being half a millimeter in, in diameter. Uh, that's a pretty small, you know, it's like about the same as a coarse hair. So it ends up looking pretty much like this. And you'll notice that, that the cartilage rings of the trachea continue as, as cartilage rings through the primary and the secondary and the tertiary bronchi. But the, as we get smaller and smaller and smaller, the uh, cartilage becomes less and less well-developed and there's more and more musculature in the walls until the smallest bronchioles uh, have uh, smooth muscle walls and can bronchioconstrict and bronchiodilate. Um, so the epithelium also changes because the pseudostratified columnar epithelium is fairly thick. And once you get into a small, small lumen, the, the, you can't have the, the thickness of the epithelium being bigger than the, the lumen. Uh, so what happens is as we get deeper in, into the bronchial tree, it goes from pseudostratified to cuboidal. Uh, and then you have fewer and fewer mucus cells, uh, fewer and fewer sylvia. Uh, cilia and like I said before the smooth muscle and the walls increase we call the very last uh, bronchi the smallest bronchi of the conducting zone the terminal bronchi the terminal means the end now the respiratory zone starts in bronchioles uh, but they're called respiratory bronchioles. They really are a continuation of the, of the terminal bronchioles. The difference being the walls are a little bit thinner and there are uh, capillary beds that surround it to facilitate gas exchange. Now, coming off of these respiratory bronchioles are uh, ducts that basically don't have a smooth muscle wall. That's the, the big difference. Uh, and they go to each alveola, and uh, or each cluster of alveoli called alveolar sacs, uh, and the alveoli themselves are where the, most of the gas exchange happens, and there's millions of them in each lung, um, and the the there's a huge amount of surface area for gas exchange. They end up looking like this, so. The terminal bronchiole gives way to the respiratory bronchioles, which then give way to each alveolar sac, which is made up of alveoli. Now, alveola is Latin for berry or grape. It really is berry. And you can see that it looks like bunches of, of berries on stalks. Um, now, 
the alveoli uh, communicate with each other through pores uh, and the air can pass through them so it's really kind of a, more of a sponge like um, situation the um, the stroma of it is primarily elastic tissue elastic connective tissue and each alveola is surrounded by uh, capillary beds and the capillary beds are in direct contact so the the walls of the capillary are in direct contact with the alveoli and they form what's called the respiratory membrane on one side of the membrane it's uh, there's air on the other side of the membrane there's blood and this is where the the oxygen and the carbon dioxide have to diffuse through this space through this this tissue uh, so really what it, the me membrane is is the alveolar and capillary walls and both of them are squamous epithelium and the and the glue that holds them together the basement membranes that are fused um, when we look at the alveoli uh, they end up looking like this huge numbers of capillaries uh, to facilitate the um, the exchange of of gases this is a photomicrograph of it. So the alveoli themselves have these elastic fibers that contain the pores. They, uh, air pressure equalizes throughout them. Uh, and they, they actually have macrophages living in the lumen of them, uh, which is actually outside the body. But they, these macrophages live there, and they eat anything that gets down that far any any debris any dust any bacteria things like that and when they when they consume whatever gets down there they end up migrating crawling up the the bronchioles until they get into the mucus and the cilia and then they get brought up to uh, and swallowed down the esophagus uh, and the proteins are then recycled so if we look at it in, in kind of a cross section through uh, the alveoli, you'll see that there's a, a couple of different types of cells in the walls. The, in this picture, the blue cells here are the macrophages that are living in, in the alveoli. The white with the purple nuclei are squamous epithelial cells and they're they're called type 1 cells and they are, are making up the um, the respiratory membrane the these light green ones are type 2 cells and their job is to secrete surfactant uh, as we talked about in class the surfactant is uh, is to um, is to break the surface tension of the water that's in the alveoli and uh, in increase compliance uh, for inflating the lungs. You'll notice how thin this is. The, the capillary wall is a squamous epithelial cell. The type 1 cell of the alveoli is a squamous epithelium and they're fused together and oxygen leaves the alveoli goes into the blood, carbon dioxide leaves the blood and goes into the alveoli uh, lumen. So the lungs, they're huge, really. They take the entire thoracic cavity except the mediastinum. And the mediastinum is the place where we have the heart and the esophagus. Uh, but really, they are, uh, they, they take up your whole. Uh, thoracic cavity, your whole chest. They're surrounded by uh, a pleura, a, a serous membrane, uh, and uh, the, the pleura that's attached to the, the ribs, to the back of the ribs, uh, like that's deep to the ribs, is called the parietal pleura. 
pleura, the serous uh, epithelium that is attached to the surface of the lung is called the visceral pleura, and the space between them is called the pleural cavity or the pleural space, and uh, it's filled with liquid called pleural fluid. And you see that it really takes up this whole area, surrounds each lung, uh, and surrounds the pericardium. When people have problems with, with pleural effusion, too much liquid in here, it can compress on the heart. People uh, with uh, pericarditis end up having problem in here and it pushes on the lungs. It can cause pain in breathing. So each lung has an apex, which is found right at the base of your neck, uh, right behind your collarbone. Uh, that's the superior tip. And the base sits on the diaphragm. The hilum is a medial, and, uh, it, and that's where the blood vessels and the bronchi, the lymphatic vessels, the nerves, and that kind of thing go in. On the left lung, there is a notch. There is a basically a cutout that accommodates the heart, and that's called the cardiac notch. The left lung is smaller because the heart takes up that, and it's made it's separated into two equally sized lobes. Uh, and what separates the lobes is a fissure called the oblique fissure because it runs obliquely. The right lung is a little bit bigger. It has three lobes. There's an oblique fissure there, and there's a horizontal fissure. Um, Each lobe is divided into segments, uh, about 10 segments per lobe, uh, and each segment is divided into lobules. Uh, and each lobule is served by a blood vessel and a bronchiole. It ends up looking like this. You'll see that there are three lobes. One, two, three here. One, two here. Now, um, the, the superior lobes are more anterior and superior, where the uh, inferior lobes are posterior and inferior. So they end up being about the same size. The, this lobe overlaps this one. So this one extends up behind here. Um, this is uh, what the bronchial tree looks like, all 23 subdivisions. There, uh, There's a blood supply to this. Uh, the pulmonary circulation we will talk about uh, when we talk about heart and uh, and blood vessels so I'm going to skip over it now we talked about the pleura thin double walled serosa uh, we looked at that and this is where we uh, started the lecture on um, on Monday.